I, I think Mario forgot I'm a kindergarten teacher that grew up in the church with all this music he's playing up in here. Lord Jesus, I was about to have a heart attack back there. Ooh, thank God my mom didn't come today. What kind of program are you running? Um, <laughs> uh, just, again, thank you all. I, one of the things, you know, everybody's been taking, um, I don't want to say advantage, but really pushing the 50th anniversary of hip hop and having these conversations. And when we thought, when we think about economic engines, when we think about cultural capital that's able to generate money, um, you know, I, I don't think you can have either one of those conversations without talking about hip hop. And um, although the industry may make a lot of money, I would say that the people who are fueling the industry maybe don't make as much money off of it. And um, I was able to um, be in space a couple times with Emil Wilbekin, who, um, if you all have not done your homework, you need to do that because this man is amazing, and not just an icon, but really has done the work in the industry. And when I think about the work that he has led and that he has done, when I think about Vibe Magazine, who in here has heard of Vibe Magazine? <laughs> who in here was like, you, you know, understanding that Vibe Magazine was to hip hop culture what uh, Tiger Beat was to the rest of the world. Um, but that he has been committed to doing that work and telling the stories and doing that as a gay man at a time when it was there was no little Nas X, right? Where it was not mainstream um, necessarily to be, to be um, fully yourself, and to take the work that he's done and to build the platform that he has for Native Son, I was just like, could you please come? And um, I'm not like Derek. I'm not going to ask him to spill all the tea that he has, but I am going to ask him to really share and talk about the work that he's done over the years, and um, just want to celebrate the 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 impact that he's had um, with telling the stories or elevating the stories or being in the middle of such a uh, uh, really culturally iconic um, magazine like Vibe magazine. So please give it up for Emil Wilbekin who is joining us this morning. Look. Hello, hello. Hello, good morning. Good morning, thank good morning, you morning so everybody. Much. Uh, thank you so much. I know, so Emil's going to be nice and not share this, but I will share this. I've been stalking him for like six months, like on, on uh, Instagram, DMing, and then having people that I know know him be like, can you tell him that I'm not crazy, that I really do just, I just value his work and want to have him in space and in front of people. And so thank you, Emil, for being here, really. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Um, I wanted to just start with, um, first off, your shoes are literally very clean. Um, um, but I wanted to just start with, you know, please share about your career and even how you got into the industry. Oh, sure. Thank you. Thank you. So, you know, just to backtrack a little bit, just because it gives context, um, I'm from Cincinnati, Ohio. I went to Hampton University for undergrad. Yeah, and he got Hampton in the house. And, um, and then I went to Columbia Journalism School in New York. I always wanted to live in New York. So this was when hip hop was really starting to bubble and things were happening. So one of my professors said, where are these parties that you're going to? Because you're, you're coming in, you're looking tired and haggard, you're getting your work done, but what are, you, what are these parties? And I said, well, they're hip hop parties. And I explained to him what rap music was and that it was this new phenomenon and it was really amazing. And he said, why don't you write about it? Mm. And so that is kind of where the story starts. So I started for my cultural affairs reporting class at Columbia writing about hip hop. When I graduated from Columbia, he recommended to have me write a piece for the New York Times wow. about hip hop. It didn't run <laughs> because, not because it wasn't good enough, they didn't understand it. Mm -hmm. And the whole story was that I made the correlation between African griots and mm -hmm. rappers. Wow. And at that time, it was just, they weren't ready. So fast forward, um, a group of friends and I are hanging out and we're talking about hip hop and dance music and 
dance hall music and how much we love it, and it would be great if we had a magazine that spoke to that. One of them got tapped to be the editor-in-chief of Vibe Magazine. Vibe Magazine was started by Warner Brothers and their partnership with Time, Inc. to try to figure out how to create a media platform that could capitalize on the music, but also support the Warner Brothers music um, mm -hmm. business. So they went to Quincy Jones, and Mr. Jones said, we should do a magazine about rap music and hip hop and R&B because, and make it like Rolling Stone and make it like Vanity Fair. Make the rap stars be the heroes of the music. Mm. And so that hadn't been done journalistically, that hadn't been done visually. And so in 1991, we did, uh, 92, we did the test issue with Tretch on the cover from Naughty by Nature. And at that time, OPP was out on the streets, <laughs> but no one really knew what it was. I mean, we knew what it was, we all knew what it was, but the world didn't know what it was. And well, let me just tell you this. There's a one, I don't know if she's here today, that um, her initials are LPP. And so she goes by LPP, and then her son was like, where'd that come from? And right. then he looked up OPP, and he was like, oh, I can't call you that. <laughs> <laughs> that, that part. <laughs> So we did this amazing cover with Tret shot by this British photographer named Albert Watson, who's best known for doing like Chardet's album covers, mm. these beautiful black and white photos, and a real journalistic piece about Tret. Um, and so they tested the magazine to see, we had Naomi Campbell wearing Versace inside. We had all these amazing wow. fashion, journalism, photography. And they did these tests and they were like, there's a market for it. Mm. And then we just celebrated the 30th anniversary of Vibe Magazine two Ooh. weeks ago, which is crazy. That is amazing. And I think the one thing um, I want to really circle back to is the idea of um, a journalistic mm. coverage, right? Like yeah. that it wasn't necessarily... Um, tabloid or some, uh, like that there was something deep about it or that there was a, a level of appreciation and validation. And so, um, you know, as you all were committed to doing that, like what's that journey like to say you're taking this kind of new craft that people may not value or appreciate or may not necessarily appreciate the people that are leading the work and what they represent and to be able to create something, first off, that's so like, that, that is still here, yeah. right, that has this kind of sustainability, but that also was really working to change the narrative of who these people were or how they were seen. So, I mean, it was, it was exciting, you know, being a young person and the music that was of our generation that was new and cutting edge and misunderstood, having a place to tell those stories. We gathered a bunch of young editors and writers and photo editors and designers from all different magazines. So we all had like mid entry level or mid level jobs and we were hungry to do more. We knew how to do more and they brought us on and gave us the opportunity. So covering hip hop from a journalistic perspective gave credibility to the music. Mm -hmm. So the record labels were really excited because it was now a platform because they were struggling to get in Rolling Stone and Spin and get coverage to sell their music. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, they could be on the cover of Vibe, they could have a feature in Vibe, they could be in a fashion story in Vibe, and they saw the record sales go up. Mm -hmm. So we were supporting the industry from a financial perspective, and then also kind of connecting dots from a financial perspective of the culture of hip hop, which mm -hmm. people, from the outside would just think, oh, it's the music and the music videos, and then later the concerts. But we're like, no, there's fashion, yes. there's beauty, there's automotive, there's jewelry, there's all these things, there's the business of hip hop. So Vibe really brought all of that journalistically to the table, and we really, I think, shifted how people saw rap and hip hop, but also how the artists saw themselves. Yeah, yeah. Um, give it up for that. That is like um, the the piece that um, you know really, and I've heard you speak about this before. And why I really wanted to have you here is what you just hit on, and I don't know if folks were picking up on it. So I want to go back to that. Creating the magazine drove up record sales. That's right. That's right. That it um, humanizing to some degree the artist 
made them more approachable, which made them more marketable, which then became the, the designs and the clothes that they were wearing, the music was selling. Um, they then became uh, a commodity in some way. That's right, yeah. And so I just wanted you to talk just a little bit about like this piece that sometimes we're so fixated on the culture piece of it or the celebration of the culture that we miss that there is money being made off of all of that. Right that may or may not get to the pockets of the people who bought the tickets or who set up the stage or who designed the clothes in some way. Or who are rapping on stage, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. That part. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it was interesting because so many of the record labels are owned by big conglomerates, um, you know, white industry. There were very few, you know, later we start having black, owned record labels and production companies that could represent those artists. But in the beginning, um, the artists were a commodity. They were, they were product, right? Mm -hmm. And so this is how you're gonna dress, this is what you're gonna do. And we saw different things happen, right? So we saw this young brother named Sean Combs, right? Come <laughs> up through Uptown Records <clears throat> and he was Focus. He's like, I'm a businessman. Mm. So, and I believe in this music. I'm from Harlem. I believe in the look of it, the feel of it, the, the music, and I'm going to change the industry. So then he was able to, you know, launch Biggie and Mary J. Blige and then Little Kim. And then he really helped blow up Jodeci and all these R&B artists. Um, Heavy D, it was really amazing the work he was able to do with Andre Harrell at Uptown Records. Andre Harrell, one of the few black record presidents right. at the time. Um, the other things that was happening, the West Coast music scene was super vibrant. It was very political, it was mm -hmm. very violent. But, you know, our second cover was Snoop Dogg, mm. right? And that was shot calling for real because yes. at this point he was brand new. Right. Um, but look at who he's become. Look. And so what Vibe was able to do was to give hold space and create space for these young entrepreneurs who are from the streets. So you mm -hmm. think about, you know, there's Puffy, there's, um, there's uh, Ice Cube, there's Snoop, and then there was also FUBU, Carl Kanai, yes. Yes. right? There are all these fashion brands. Mm -hmm who, you know, selling things out of the back of their cars. But we saw this marketing machine that is very hood for most <laughs> of us, right? We yeah. know what it is, right? It's from the, the parking lot to the side street the to the hustle. table. But we all of a sudden were able, able to amplify that in a way. So you think about FUBU, like they were selling T-shirts and stuff out of the back of their car in parking lots at malls in New York City, right? And, and in the outer boroughs. Then they were like, okay, let's get smart. Carl Kanai was like making his clothes and intentionally dressing um, mm. the rappers who were coming up. So there was like a whole ecosystem that we were a part of. Mm. And I think like for Carl Kanai, it was really smart. Like he made clothes in Biggie's size. So Biggie, <laughs> brand new artist, is wearing Where Carl Kanai sweats who's out mm. on the street. So there was a whole black economic system that was at work, that was growing, that has now become, you know, at one point became a $15 billion industry. Right. I mean, that represents... I think to your point, the hustle, right? Yeah. And so much of what we come to normalize, whether it is bean pies or I guess people don't do CDs anymore, but like, you know, mm. the or the DVDs in the parking lot. The painted t-shirts. The painted t-shirts, <laughs> right? Like the, the hustle that folks are like, I'm gonna get out here mm -hmm. and I'm gonna do this. I know Michelle G was in here and like her talking about like, mm -hmm getting a book and selling yeah. it like, yeah. you know, person to person, like that hustle mm -hmm. is, is so much a part of the culture to some degree. Um, but there are also some things that, uh, and sometimes hustle has been used as a bad word, but it's, it's, right. it's not necessarily a bad right. word. No, it's not a bad word, but to your earlier point, if we didn't hustle, we would be products, right? Mm. We would be under a contract, we wouldn't be making a lot of money, we would be kind of at the whim of the record label and being forced to like not even own your own image and then your name, hmm. right? And so we saw so much of that. And then, you know, adjacent to what was happening at that time, you think about what happened with Prince, right? Mm -hmm. So that was happening all That's at the right. same time. So you have to connect the dots of like, people were tired of being used and commodified and really pushed and hustled 
to create thriving businesses. And then now what we're seeing with, you know, Puffy and Jay-Z or Diddy or Love, whatever right. his name is today, <laughs> right. uh, my friend, um, <laughs> but Jay-Z, and you, you see it with these other artists, they're selling off the things that they create, liquor brands, clothing yes. brands, yes. all that stuff, and making even more money mm -hmm. for the Basquiat's on their walls. Yeah, okay. I mean, that that's the piece that I think, like, it's this evolution to get there. Um, and then there's, like, the greatness of it, and then you... You were like working at Vibe during some of the more challenging times about like the stories that were being told or the narrative that sometimes could be co-opted and be a negative story. And so with this recent like arrest in the Tupac right. murder. Like that long? It yeah. took y'all to find and, Well, I mean the pressure about like, well now we really can't because he's been talking about it so much <laughs> right. that we got to do great. something. Right, exactly. R but like what was that like to be like in the throes of that with the East Coast, West Coast beef and like having to tell these stories and, and like managing like I mean, that? when we started working there at Vibe and, and just knowing and loving hip hop music and culture and rap music, there's always this side of violence connected to it, right? There's always the dark side right. that was connected to the vibrance of the music. Um, and it was scary a little bit because it got really scary with the East Coast, West Coast kind of drama. And um, when there were shootouts, right? When people were getting like shot in the record um, recording Story. studios, like in the elevator or the doorway, then you start to get nervous, right? Because you're like, well, what's, are they gonna have a shootout at the concert? You know, and then you're at the club and we had that already. Um, let's remember we're coming out of the crack era. Right. So it's not like we didn't know violence, but it's different when it's all glamorized. And then it's different when you're seeing people your age mm. killing each other. So that was really, really tough. And so because we took this journalistic stance for the good stuff, you got to have <laughs> the journalistic stance for the not great stuff. Yeah. And so Vibe got caught in the middle of really the tension of the East Coast, West Coast drama. And then we, because of um, a woman from the Bay Area, Danielle Smith, who oh, was yeah. the editor-in-chief at the time, she really made it clear that we were going to report on this um, the way like the New York Times would. And, you know, folks like it when you're telling a good story. They don't <laughs> like when you're telling the real story all the time. So it, we kind of got blamed for a lot of the violence, but we were just reporting on what was happening. Yeah. But it was scary. It was yeah. scary and exciting. I just, I teach journalism now at the Fashion Institute of Technology in New York. Give it uh, up for a meal on that one, <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's good, it's important. Yeah. And I was telling my class and very young folks, how we were talking about Tupac's killer being caught and stuff like that. And I was telling them I was at the Vibe party after the Soul Train Awards where Biggie was killed. Wow. And how I left the party because the energy felt weird to me, which mm. Michelle G will understand. Like, I just <laughs> felt weird. I got to get out of here. And um, my friends were blowing me up on my phone and calling my hotel the next day because we didn't have smartphones and all that. It's like very two-way <laughs> pager time. <Yeah. laughs> and... I didn't know what happened because I left and they were like, Biggie was killed outside of y'all's party last night. Mm -hmm. And so that's scary. And one of the reasons I left the party was because I didn't feel safe. Mm -hmm. There was, it's just something about it. You know, you trust that instinct. And so, so there were a lot of different things. And then we had a couple of incidents where some rappers would come up to the office to let us know they didn't like, like the, story. the stuff. <laughs> and it's like, okay, y'all. Um, <laughs> I mean, like, who, go to Rolling Stone. They're actually not going to cover you, so um, you could do that. But it was, it was an exciting time. Yeah. It was very exciting. Well, I mean, speaking of safe spaces, I wanted you to talk a little bit about the work you're doing with Native Son and to create safe spaces. Yes and what that is. So I, I just, I love that you are doing that. And, you know, we're talking a little bit, when we were talking earlier, just about even the the industry and the opportunity to elevate. And I was saying, you know, you know, following Native Son and seeing all these wonderful, like, gay black weddings has just been, like, over the top. Over the top. <laughs> and I'm like, that's another industry where folks need to be thinking about. I know we had Kayla and some other folks talking about being florists or trying to get into the different industries. But just kudos to you for starting that. Share a little bit about what it is and, and why you created it. So 
I was working at Essence Magazine. I had been there for, I guess, like five or six years. An incredible, right, to work at a legacy brand like that, what it has represented for black women, um, what it represented for our community. So when I got the opportunity to go work there, um, I took it because I was overseeing digital. And um, they wanted me to help, you know, it's a legacy magazine, so it's our auntie, our mother's, our grandmother's magazine. So how do you make it for younger women? So I brought in street style and, you know, a lot of Rihanna hair, you know, galleries and stuff like that. We were doing all the stuff that young, and then Black Love became a franchise because someone submitted their wedding. Mm. And so we started doing that every Wednesday and it became really um, popular. And I say all this to say, my time at Essence was so amazing, but I was like, I want this experience for me and my own community. Mm -hmm. And I would sit in this powerful room, they do black women in Hollywood, and I would sit in this room during Oscar week and hear Viola Davis and Angela Bassett and Gabrielle Union, all of them telling their stories. And I was like, I wanna have that for black gay men because I feel like we're there, but we're kind of invisible and we're not necessarily out and you're not, allowed to be out necessarily in Hollywood sometimes. And so how can you have that fellowship and that support for black, gay, and queer men? So that sat with me. So leave Essence, get laid off, get a great severance, go to India on an eat, pray, love journey. Because <laughs> listen, you know, you need a reset. And so I went and I wanted to go somewhere where I was uncomfortable, where I didn't know the language. And I was at this um, Ayurvedic retreat doing a cleanse, and I was journaling every morning, and I would hear these fishermen, this is the interesting part I never connected to recently, I would hear these fishermen singing, pulling their nets in every morning um, while I'd be out journaling on my terrace, and there's no Wi-Fi and all this stuff, and I was journaling one day, and this idea and this voice kind of came to me of like, black gay men, you need to do something, and I was like, okay. So then I keep journaling, keep journaling, keep journaling. I come home from India for six weeks, and my friend, I, I had this epiphany. I had my Oprah moment. <laughs> and my friends were like, you've been talking about that. But it wasn't clear to me that I had been talking about that. Like I had been talking about, but it was subconsciously for me. So I thought, what, what does it look like? So I took what I learned at Essence. I took what I learned at Vibe. And how do you build community? And how do you show community in a way that people don't see it coming, right? How do you show black, gay, and queer men as the heroes that mm. they are? So when I talk about Native Son, it's inspiration and empowerment for black, gay, and queer men. But it's named after James Baldwin's notes of a Native Son. So he's mm. kind of our icon figure. And then I think about Alvin Ailey. And I think about Bayard Rustin, who was Martin Luther King's lieutenant, and along with Ralph Abernathy, staged the March on Washington. There's an amazing movie coming out in November. We're going to um, do a screening. Netflix. We're going to yeah. do a screening. Oh, good, yeah. Maybe you'll come back. Maybe I'll come back. <laughs> um, and it's, it's a powerful story, but these are men, you know, Marlon Riggs, who was from the Bay, who did Tongues Untied, which was this really incredible, powerful film about the AIDS pandemic and what was happening, and because no one was speaking to black gay men about it. Mm -hmm. And so I thought about all these people, Elon Harris, I could go on and yeah. on, but they were invisible. So how do you make them visible? So I started this platform um, seven years ago, and suddenly we're like 70 something thousand on Instagram. Mm. Our, our corporate partners are everyone from Cadillac, AARP, um, P&G, Citibank, um, I can keep going. Like, it's incredible. And the sales pitch was, there is a community of me mm. that you all are not tapping into. You like me, you're comfortable with me, you support me in the work that I do to elevate black communities and culture. Well, there's a black gay community that you're overlooking who have a lot of money, they love fashion, they love travel, they love weddings, and <laughs> a lot of them are actually executives that you don't even know exist in yes. your midst. And that was the, the idea. And then how do we make that a safe space for us, but also um, how do we then to everyone else show 
that we are enough, right? That we are who we are. Yes, I, I mean, I know, yes, please clap it up for that. I mean, yesterday we were having a talk and folks were like, I wanna make sure that folks are very clear. He's sharing his experience and it is not limited to, as we talk about like how to build platforms, how to build places, how to build spaces, he's doing one that's very specific to his community. But that you can apply that approach to whatever resonates to you and your experience. The point that we're talking about, and this is where I wanna go before we go to the audience, is you talked about giving a voice to the voiceless. And that role and that need to make that happen. And I think each of us in this space have the ability to say whether it's about um, second language, whether it's about immigrants, whether it is about lesbian, whether it's about gay. Like there are places and spaces where we are like, if you don't say it, it won't be said. Right. And so I think that's the, the piece that I really take from who you are and what you bring to this. Like, how are we making sure that people who don't feel seen get seen? Yeah. I mean, it's an assignment, right? It's a calling. And you have to be fearless in your pursuit of your passions, right? You have to, if you have a great idea and you believe that it is powerful, um, in our communities, we have so many amazing stories, thinkers, visionaries, creatives who don't ever get the opportunity because they're scared to, mm -hmm. because they're told by society and white supremacy that they're not allowed to. And you have to push past that and tell your story. One of the things, I'll tell two examples that'll tie this up really nicely, which is Vibe won the National Magazine Award, which is like the Oscar of magazines. And yeah, y'all can please. <laughs> And I said that in my speech when I accepted the award is like giving voice to the voiceless because that's what hip hop did, yes. right? Hip hop was like, we're tired of being treated as second class citizens. We're tired of police brutality. We're tired of not getting our fair share, being redlined, all the things, and we're gonna speak up about it. And look what happened, right? And then you said something when you introduced me, which really stuck with me, is that in my lifetime, I never thought I would see a little Nas X, hmm. right? I would never see a young 26, 27-year-old black queer boy, man, who's now like Grammy winning, like millions of albums, deals with all these different brands and making all this money and living in his truth and in his freedom. And so that's what can happen when you believe in your dream and you speak life into it and you get past the fear and past what people have told you you can't do and say, I'm going to do it anyway because we stand on the shoulders of ancestors who have only done that. Ooh, yes. Um, listening to you talk, it made me think about yesterday, Michelle was saying, like, faith over fear like believing in something and not letting the, the fear take control. That's right. And I think that um, doing something new, like vibe, like being on the, the, the beginning of that to say, I'm gonna work in this space where you're talking about an industry, where you're talking about um, a people, you're talking about a movement that folks were like maybe not willing to accept or even starting um, Native Son, like being in these spaces where it's like, I'm gonna do this because it is a calling, like that takes a tremendous amount of bravery and, um, and it's not even sometimes always about the faith in like it's gonna be this big thing, but it's in the faith that I know this is what I was meant to do. Absolutely, and I think it's listening to that, right? What, what you feel in your gut. Um, I mean, one of the things is people always ask me like, why didn't you ever go work at like Vogue or GQ or other play, like big white media platforms or Vanity Fair? And it's like, I love those platforms, but I love my people more, Ooh. right? And why not make our black media platforms excellent? Why not make them go head to head against those platforms? Um, I think the other part is we have so much economic power that yes. it's just hidden. Right? Yes. And, and I think about in the future, we should be thinking about data, right? Who owns our data? We own so much data. We are the thought leaders. We are the creators, the original influencers. We have all the best ideas. I mean, look at black women in hair, period. <laughs> the fact that everybody is like wearing extensions and has weaves now, it just blows my yeah. mind. 
And it's like, it's not new to us, <laughs> right? Like, we've been doing that. So it's, it's about, like, believing in yourself, um, trusting that gut instinct, faith over fear, for sure, and, um, and just trusting and thinking about people who have done that over and over again in our community um, coming to this country with nothing mm -hmm. and look what we've been able to build and that we're still here. And particularly when you're in spaces here in the Bay Area, which is, is so out clear, right, that black folks know how to say stuff, do stuff, and organize, right? We can do it. We can do it. Give it up for Emil. Um, we can take, I think we have time for, depending how long it takes you to ask it, we have a little bit of time for a couple of questions. Anyone, um, I think John is looking for hands. Anybody? I can't. Oh, there you go. One right here in the front, and then Derek over here. <laughs> yeah, and, and I'm going to be real quick and just say one. The first subscription I ever had was Vibe magazine. So, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> uh, and then I wonder if you could just maybe put what you all did in a generational context. It seems to me that uh, you ushered in a movement with hip hop and, and media is a critical component of a movement. Uh, but maybe in a generational context, what was there before, what you did, and what, what can come after? Sure, no, obviously a great question from a great man and thinker. <laughs> um, so, you know, Quincy Jones was very clear that he wanted Vibe to be what Rolling Stone was to rock and roll, right? So if you think about it from that perspective, um, he knew that hip hop was going to become this very huge um, musical cultural force, but economic force as well. So if you think about how we started, you know, in 1992, and there, you know, a little bit of radio play on black stations only, right? MTV hadn't, was <laughs> kind of happening, but those were all white videos at that point. And then for it to completely turn and where it becomes rap and hip hop and R&B become pop music, right? <laughs> and then you think about the icons of um, who came out of hip hop, right? Who are now doing everything. Like we're in everything from music to films to, to Sesame television. Sesame Street. You think, right, Sesame <laughs> Street. You think of Queen Latifah, everybody, right? Like there's so much vibrancy that has come from hip hop. Then you think bigger than that too about, yes, Will Smith. I mean, we can just stay here and list everybody. But when you look at luxury fashion now, when you look at the way automotive ads that have hip hop music in them now are played, that is from this culture. That is the impact that rap music has grown into a global influence. There are breakdancing, graffiti <laughs> all over the world. So it is, that's the impact, right? And a lot of people in this room, y'all probably didn't even know a world without hip hop, right? Mm -hmm. But that's how big it's become. And I think you even think about President Obama, right? Like he's related to the impact of hip hop. So I hope this clarifies. Thank you. Um, John, there was somebody right here. Thank you. Um, thank you for being here today. Um, so, you know, related to the last question, I suppose, there's been a lot of discourse lately about the state of hip-hop journalism, which I suppose is kind of related to the state of journalism writ large, like newspapers and the decline and um, all of that. But there's also this conversation about how black journalists and news outlets are routinely sort of like ignored by mainstream um, artists PR and things like that. And like, OK Player just laid off their entire editorial department um, and it just seems like as our culture becomes more mainstream and thus obviously more profitable we tend to get shut out of it and so um, yeah you know like I no shade to John Caramonica from the New York Times or anything but like I feel like there's some nuances he misses when he's talking about ice spice so it seems like we need to have 
obviously representation in our media as well as our culture because when our culture gets amplified that you know like we lose uh, a lot of nuance anyway so um i was wondering if you could speak to this evolution of black-led music journalism from the perspective of somebody who was like a pioneer throughout everything and you know like could we even cre recreate the alchemy that um, you know, the conditions that existed to create Vibe and Double XL and all of those magazines that uh, spurred this movement. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> all right. Look, look. feel like I'm back at school at <laughs> FIT. <laughs> so, you know, when, when I interviewed at FIT, they asked me, what are the three reasons why you want to teach journalism? So I said, number one, I said, as a give back to the community. I said, number two, representation. What I realized when I was interviewing is there is less than 6% of faculty members in the United States are black people. So who's teaching our kids? Mm. And who, not only who's teaching our kids, who's teaching everybody's kids? That's right. Right? That's right. And then the third and last was to uplift the craft of journalism mm. in a fake news world. Hmm. So we have to put that in context as well, right? I think the issue, and I'm, Michelle and I could be it here ad nauseum talking about <laughs> black media, um, it's sad. You know, you're 100% right. Our culture, our people, our stories get commodified, and there's a ton of nuances left. At Essence, I remember, you know, all those Hollywood actresses, that's the only place they could go. Now, it's like Vogue, Harper's Bazaar, Vanity Fair, I mean, anywhere, right? Um, and oftentimes, I mean, a little bit after George Floyd, we had like a 18 month window. Um, <laughs> it was good for me because it actually got me writing again because everyone was scouring the world <laughs> looking for black journalists. Um, I was like, I got a national magazine award on my coffee table, what's good? <laughs> um, but at the end of the day, um, there's just challenges around black media. I think part of it is access to capital. I think part of it is business acumen and knowledge. Um, and then how do we create that magic again? I don't know if we can, but what we can do is arm folks to know how to tell stories properly, who to, to show them that they can do it and other people have done it. Um, Hip hop is in a weird space because the music's not great. <laughs> <laughs> it's just not like I go to the club. Y'all can I'm like, clap. Y'all don't be. They're like, I don't want nobody to hear me clapping. <laughs> it ain't good, y'all. Like for real. Um, I think it's interesting that there's this wave of these young black women rappers. That's very interesting to me, and we need to pay attention to that. There's also a huge queer movement too. That's kind of integrated into that. So it, it's got to change. But we've got to keep fighting for the spaces, media and fashion and music are still super duper segregated and mm. they don't want us in. So I think about, well, if we don't have our own, then who? So it's challenging. You're thank welcome. You so um, thank you so much for uh, everything you shared. Hip hop has so much uh, impact on our society and culture in America. And I'm just curious, now that black people are uh, more in charge of their own um, businesses in the industry and the movement. Is there uh, thought leaders uh, who are focused on um, shifting to a more social or um, moral responsibility in terms of rebranding what, you know, um, we could make profit in besides just what has been happening, what made the business successful? I want to say yes, but I don't think that's true. Um, I think that we still live, so let me back up. There was a young queer, um, black queer young man who was stabbed to death in a gas station in New York mm -hmm. City for dancing to Renaissance mm -hmm. with his friends. 25 miles away or less, Beyonce was performing Renaissance in um, New Jersey. That, when that happened, there was no leadership. Like I reached out to Al Sharpton and his team about, because everyone was like, what is Native Son gonna do? And you know, it, it dawned on me, we don't have leadership. We don't have leadership in our country. We don't have leadership and we don't have black leaders. We, we have people that are doing things, we have pockets. 
but we don't have a overall strategy or leadership or charismatic person that we're following. And so I think a lot of people are just kind of surviving in their different pockets of like, I made it. Like I think about Jay-Z a lot and I think he gives back a lot and it's great that the Brooklyn um, Library is celebrating his work and his lyrics and from him going from selling drugs to who he's become. But I don't see this conglomerate of these rappers coming together and business people is like, how do we really make a change? They donate money, they do stuff, they all do stuff. But until we kind of come together holistically as a community, it's just not gonna happen. Which is a little sad. Hi. Truth, like the, I think that's what we, I was telling uh, Derek last week, I was like, you know, I, I don't mind you being brutally honest because we, we're not gonna tackle a thing until we face it. Yeah. And if we're not honest about where we are, then we're gonna keep pretending and we're not gonna be able to kind of make a change. So I, I think sometimes the truth is sad, but you know, hopefully it also is motivational and inspirational for folks to be like, okay, we need to start this movement. We need to build this, this, this work. So. Yeah, and I think people have had to fight so hard to get to this place of success that they kind of lose sight of the overall struggle, right? And I think that a lot of that is our systems and structures that are in place mm -hmm. that, um, that block us from really coming together and galvanizing the way we need to. Because this, and that's I think one of the things with Native Son I'm very, very clear about. It's not just about black gay and queer men, right? right? It's about the black community accepting everybody mm -hmm regardless of their sexual orientation or preference, because if one of our brothers or sisters is hurting, we're all hurting. That's right. Right? And so until we get past a lot of these things that have been built to separate us yep. from slavery days, we will not move forward. Thank you for that. Amen. So we've got Mario and then Savi in the front here will be our, our last question. Thank you. Very well spoken, um, your, your chair. Um, 2010, I was um, asked to do some styling for um, the first black gay testing makes a stronger HIV ad. And the ad was international and went all over New York subway, billboards, even at BART here in, in San Francisco. And Vibe was the first magazine that I was able to be in to show that, that, that gay piece of testing makes us stronger. Amen. And it was Vibe that picked up the story and that was my first ad. So thank you for that. Amen. You're welcome. Aw. See, I love that. Thank you. Savi's right here next to Dr. Sai. Thank you very much for your work and for being here. I wanted to ask a question about international solidarity. You mentioned that uh, Rap has influenced young people all over the world, and young people all over the world are using it to talk about their realities. I, I think of the woman who won the Nobel Peace Prize today from Iran, and Iranian young people are rapping about the discrimination that they face and the marginalization. Yeah. Can you speak a bit about that and, and what that meant for you? Yeah, I think... I mean, it's so interesting because I hear all these amazing stories from people um, who have been influenced by Vibe, right? And literally, we were hustling. We were like, this hasn't been done. We were scrappy. We were doing all this work to amplify this music and, and the message of the music. What's been really interesting is I've met um, a young Indian woman that grew up in Australia who begged her mother to get her a subscription to Vibe. Right, I hear stories about folks in Africa who, you know, it was really hard to get. We weren't internationally distributed. Um, and just young people, right? And I think the power that you see of not just vibe, but hip hop, is that it allowed folks to realize that they could be more than their circumstance, mm -hmm. right? And so I think that that's what's so powerful about that music. Um, and as we celebrate 50 years, right, of people telling their truth, yeah. and you see, again, how diverse it is, how global it is, um, its impact in Africa is huge, in South America, in the Middle East, 
I mean, hip hop is the music of the people now. And so I think that really speaks to, so it's amazing that the woman was, acknowledges that and you know, who is honored today because it really is about, I think, giving voice to people and making them feel like I can say what I need to say, I want to rise up against different forms of oppression, and I'm going to do that, and I'm allowed to do that because I have a hip hop attitude. Give another round for that. Like, so this is our real, real, um, our really last one. But I just have to say this because my mind, like some people know this, I think in songs sometimes. So when I was like, I'm not internationally known, but I'm known across the microphone. I just want to thank you, Sabi, for inspiring that yeah. in my mind. <laughs> That was good. That was really good. Um, go ahead, Zach. Thank you so much for this conversation. Um, I appreciate you posing the question, who are our kids learning from? Um, especially as we enter more into this digital age, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok are becoming writ large uh, classrooms where people are actively taking information and carrying on with their lives. This is a Morehouse grad right here, by the way. He just I see the notes on the phone. Go ahead. I, I see the Hampton with you. Uh, certain facts can be sensationalized while the actual story goes untold. So I'm wondering, how can people be more conscious about their media diet, especially through the lens of hip-hop media? Woof, okay. Yes, Morehouse man. Um, yeah, I mean, social media, you know, we've a lot of this becomes a gift and a curse, right? Like, it's amazing that we have social media. It's amazing that you can have your whole family reunion on Facebook, right? <laughs> um, it's amazing that if someone dies, we can all mourn together, right? And, and conversely, when someone wins, like when Kamala wins, we can all celebrate <laughs> um, her and, other, and tons of people, right? I think the issue is this whole fake news, fake journalism, and how can people be discerning about where they're getting their news, what they're putting out there. Um, and now we're entering this whole phase, which is a heavy on everybody's mind, which is AI, right? Mm. So um, I, w I had the privilege of going to TED, which is this thought leadership conference. It's very like the, the most renowned people from all over the world. And one of the things that they talked about is like, well, who's programming the AI, right? Because yeah. if we're not in that STEM system and we're not in those rooms, then how is, how is AI being programmed? So I think you have to be super discerning. Like I have to manage how much I'm on social because I'll start, you know, like there's great things about it, but there's not. Um, and I think it's like anything, you have to have like balance. Um, I think supporting black media is super important. Also supporting um, social justice activists, thought leaders who really have something positive and powerful to say and plugging into those folks. And then you have your dance videos and all this other stuff in between. Um, but really thinking about who's creating the news that you're ingesting and is that healthy? And it's, it's, a, it's hard. It's really hard. There's a lot of fake news. There's a lot of propaganda out there, um, and it's getting worse. And so I think that's why it's important that how, how do we speak up um, is important. How do we have a voice? Um, and then what are you taking in, and how much of it are you taking in? And then what are you sharing, right? Because you can be a catalyst for change as well. I try to share when things come up that are really, really important stories that I think our community needs. I share it on my social media feed. So does that speak to it? Okay, perfect. Thank you. I'm Thank like, you. now I'm going to be talking about media diet. He gave me a new phrase to be. Uh, so again, I, I hope everyone recognizes and understands just the quality of folks and the the just amazingness of all the people that have come through here the last couple of days, including the amazing, great Emil yeah. yeah. Wilbekin. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Director Davis. Thank you.